Um, thank you, Eric, for the giving the context because uh, basically uh, I plan to start with saying everything is political when you come to speak about teaching Arabic in. Uh, I use the term Jewish schools, and that's not very politically correct. Is that what I meant to say is schools where Hebrew is the language of instruction. So you could say Hebrew schools or you say Hebrew that is uh, um, <coughs> So that's the point. Um, there is so much to say about that and I don't know how to fit this in 10 minutes. So I'll start with the end and say what are the two main um, issues that I found very interesting lately. Uh, when I'm looking at uh, teaching Arabic in, um, in Jewish schools or in Hebrew-speaking schools, what is the relation between the official status of the language? I think uh, um, you asked about that before. And the educational language policy. We can talk about this for hours. There's basically a huge mismatch. Arabic is a co-official language, but it's, uh, it's not something that you can get very easily from the educational language policy. Uh, you only mentioned that English has a, has a much stronger status in the educational language policy. Um, and the thing that I want to focus on today is actually the bottom-up policy initiatives. And um, we'd like to have uh, Dandy Kumani, who is one of the, um, the head of the, one of the projects that I'm, that I'm going to mention. And you can um, fill in some of the details if, if I miss them. Because I think it's, it's, um, it's an amazing opportunity to look at a uh, process of policy and, uh, and a change of policy. And um, um, I wrote here policy versus practice. Ilana Sharma wrote about this uh, quite uh, recently. Uh, and she was asking, uh, should we even look at policy, at official policy? Because uh, um, can we be sure that those official policies that were written sometime somewhere were really meant to be implemented? Maybe, may, maybe we want to look at practices and what actually happens. And yes, it's very interesting to look at what actually happens. But I think at the end of the day, you also want to want to look at uh, what the person here said before: the institutional support. Because if if that doesn't happen, then I think at at, at one point. Uh, those practices can just vanish, and this is what we, we, we see over the years. Plus, we are quite lucky that we have quite a few, um, uh, quite a large number of empirical studies that have been done on those bottom-up initiatives, and this is what I was looking uh, at for, for this uh, presentation. I reviewed over 10 uh, different studies that were done by academics and, and some kind of, uh, of professional reports on those Problems and um, and I'll tell you what I think uh, um, they mean in terms of policy. Uh, so it was mentioned the policy is to teach Arabic uh, grade seven till uh, nine, and and you only mentioned that that somehow it got uh, uh, to this to this point in which um, uh, principals can choose between Arabic and and French, but this is this was not the intention of the of the uh, policy writers, and it is written uh, um, in one of the um, state, um, in, in one of the documents in 1996, that there should have been specific criteria to choose French over Arabic, but uh, uh, that somehow became the um, um, the practice that, that principals can choose, and um, and in terms of what happened in practice, I'll just say this. Uh, this was on the news at, uh, about three years ago that about one third of um, high school, of junior high schools, uh, don't choose Arabic, even though it's a, it's a compulsory subject. And someone was interviewed saying, "What if they didn't choose math? Would the parents just say okay?" Or what if they didn't uh, uh, teach uh, um, English? What if they didn't teach, I don't know, sciences? The fact that in one third of, of the schools, the principals or the teachers or whoever, but we'll see that in a second, uh, decide not to choose Arabic and it's still an, an okay practice, I think it says a lot. 
over these uh, continuous debates of whether to teach the literary dialect, the literary variety, or the spoken variety, whether there should be native speakers, uh, teachers who are native speakers or not, um, um, continuous debates of whether the achievements of the students are, are, are good enough, and there's a general, um, uh, I would say, uh, uh, agreement that the, the achievements of, of uh, school um, children that graduate after three <coughs> years of the compulsory studies are very poor. Um, this was just to say that, that it's so political that whenever someone talks about uh, should we uh, change the official status of Arabic, uh, should it still be an official uh, language or not, then the issue of uh, being whether it should or should not be compulsory subject in, uh, in schools comes up, but I will not read it because we really don't have time. Um, this is just one very quick, um, relatively recent study that we're looking at how successful th this, this compulsory uh, uh, program is. They were giving some tasks to, uh, to students who were studying after one year of the compulsory studies and the, the success rate was 20%. And Alon Fogman, the, the, the guy who did that study, said they repeated that study and several times and they get up to 25% after three years of, uh, of studying. So it's, it's not working. About those bottom-up <coughs> initiatives, um, what can we learn from, um, uh, from those projects? Uh, first of all, have they been evaluated? And I'll show that, yes, quite extensively, and we can learn a lot from those uh, uh, studies. And, and of course, asking whether they are successful or not, it depends on what were the aims uh, uh, that those uh, um, uh, usually NGOs that started them um, um, put in front of their eyes. Was it to change the policy? Was it to uh, um, get more um, Arabs into the system as teachers? Was it coexistence between uh, uh, Jews and Arabs? Was it all of that? So, of course, if you're saying successful, it has to be uh, uh, related to the actual aims of those uh, programs. Um, so the main uh, uh, player in this bottom-up initiatives is, is Abraham Fan initiative. They started the, the project called Yas Salam 2004 and with uh, uh, 15 schools and today they're working over 200 schools. They have over 750 classes and, and I suppose they have something like 20% of the elementary uh, um, uh, students that actually study uh, Arabic today. And this is a huge change of practice because uh, uh, before those projects, I mean, there was a project by Tel Aviv uh, a couple of years ago that had like 40 classes, but then for all different reasons, which I can't get into, it, that, that project stopped. There's a very, very small project that was in a in um, a college called K in, uh, in Be'er Sheva. But uh, uh, the fact that today some 2,400,000 2, elementary school children study Arabic before the seventh grade and study the spoken variety, they call it the communicative variety, which is slightly different, but I, I suppose most people would agree that it's the spoken with some exposure to the written uh, um, variety. So they start earlier than the official age that the policy decided and they are being taught by native uh, uh, speakers of Arabic. Um, it's a huge change. But we'll see in a second whether this has gone uh, completely up. Okay, if we're saying going from uh, uh, bottom up, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, okay, and, and Merchavim, that's another project, another NGO, they put a, um, a focus on, um, on uh, shared citizenship, and, and there are a few more, but I'll, I'll skip that. They want to expose uh, Hebrew speakers to Arabic from an earlier age than the seventh grade, okay? And they want to get those students to have better um, um, skills in Arabic. 
They might want to include Arabic as the core curriculum, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, some of them say that this is the main aim, but some of them say uh, different things. Um, some of them claim that they want to make Arabic a second language in Jewish schools, but there might be a very um, um, long vision. Uh, of course, Jewish art coexistence and employment opportunities for Arab teachers. Um, you can't read it, I know, but it's just to show you that there are um, um, a lot of studies that have been done on those initiatives. And um, recently I was doing a study on, on the policy of bilingual science that you could hardly get uh, people that were actually uh, uh, reviewing uh, the policies. This is very, very, very schematic. I mean, if I wanted to do it right, I would have to have arrows going all over the place. But let's say you start from the project people. And um, this is what most of the studies we're looking at. Are students happy? Are parents happy? Are the teachers happy? I'll show you in a minute, but basically everyone is saying yes. Everyone is happy. Students are very happy. Attitudes are more positive. Parents uh, are happy. The teachers are happy. And then school's principals are usually very uh, happy. But now, is it going to become part of the system? Is it going to be adopted by the, uh, um, by the ministry? Uh, it's, it's becoming very complicated. It depends on funds in, in, a, in a really complicated way that I can't get into all the details. And of course it depends on whether the program is good. It depends on academic research. Surprisingly enough, there is a role of, of, uh, of what uh, uh, linguists and applied linguists say for better and for worse. I mean, we drag something from the 80s of uh, one PhD dissertation that said, uh, yeah, if you teach spoken Arabic before you teach the literary Arabic, that's going to create a mess for the students, and that, that changed policy. And it's, people are still working on, on, on changing the impression of that, of that study. Um, and then also the role of the, of the municipalities. Um, I hope to be able to, to get to some of that in, in a minute or two. Um, so my time is up. Okay, so if I had time, I would show you that uh, students are very happy, um, parents are very happy, our teachers are very happy, um, school principals are very happy, and uh, I would maybe I would I wanted to raise some questions about whether this is really are going to be integrated into the system and some ethical uh, um, questions of whether, whether or not we want, at the end of the day, private, uh, um, um, I would say, um, NGOs to run the, um, um, the system uh, um, for us as much as, as, as the pedagogical and the ideological aims are, are, are super important. I hope to have some time to uh, um, uh, to say a little bit more about it during the discussion.